Studio A3R. I am your host, Jennifer Slurtle. Studio A3R is dedicated to feature people and resources that help strengthen personal resilience, responsiveness, and reflection. It is my belief that your competitive advantage is the way you scan your environment and make decisions. I hope our program helps you make better decisions. Our guest is Matthew E. May. You may know him as a six-time author, amazing keynote speaker, and strategy advisor for Insight Partners, which is a leading global venture capital and private equity firm investing in high-growth technology companies that are really driving technology. The reason I have him as a guest is uh, actually in 2012, I was gifted the book, The Laws of Subtraction, which literally, I think when that book came out, I was posting maybe once a week because the idea of taking things away and looking for what's not there was so profound. But his latest book is entitled What the Unicorn Knows, How Leading Entrepreneurs Use Lean Principles to Drive Sustainable Growth. And this was actually published this year, and it's already gotten international acclaim. His background, of course, spans over 30 years of experience advising, facilitating, and really driving strategy, and has been heavily influenced through a decade at Toyota. And that's really when we started learning about Agile in the Kanban process really came from a lot of the work that he had done with Toyota. You have seen his work in the New York Times, Harvard Business Review, Fast Company, and he's a graduate of the Wharton School and John Hopkins University. And he's an avid cyclist. I am so lucky to get to see many pictures of him on many trips. And he also has a beautiful wife and daughter. And it's so exciting to see people that are thought leaders that also have balance and also can cultivate a family. A lot of people kind of choose a career or family. And Matt, I have to say, has done an incredible job of being a humanitarian, a strategist, and and just a wonderful person. With that, Matt, I'd like to just say hello and introduce yourself. I can't. I can't uh, do any better than that. I think. I think we're done here. There. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Um, I. Yeah, I'm Matt. I'm here to to answer your questions and have a fun um, hour or so discussion. Excited to do this. I, I love one of one of the things that my co-author and I really wanted to do was to take this book and somehow get it into college and graduate business school curriculums in some form or fashion. Um, and this is one of the first few instances that, that's going to allow us to do that. And I love the fact that we're going to have kind of an interactive discussion rather than a talking head uh, session with just an abbreviated q and I, I pr- much prefer this. So I don't know the best way to proceed. I know I, I have all the questions. Um, there are a lot of them. I can... Should we just take them in order and you all introduce yourselves and the question in the order that they were given to me? Is that the best way to do it? I think that's perfect. This program, we decided to break into two different episodes. So the first episode really is going to be about mindset and a little bit more about Matt's personal philosophy. The second is actually going to dive more into uh, what the unicorn knows and be a little bit more about strategy. And so with that, I think, Cole, did you have the first question? Yeah. So one of my questions was you talk about how to like foster a sense of teamwork and camaraderie in an organization and how that uh, contributes um, to success. Uh, could you like elaborate on what practical steps, like what does that physically look like within a company? You're referring to esprit de corps. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, it's kind of funny. I just got back from three days in New York City with uh, the company that I'm um that I'm employed by Insight Partners, and I'm in Los Angeles, and and almost the rest of all the rest of the company is in um, New York City area. Um, although a lot of them are spread out, and we we very rarely get a chance to come together. But one of the things that we did over the three days was because we have grown so fast, um, we needed to actually sort of eat our own cooking, so to speak, when it comes to uh, establishing some esprit de corps, some teamwork, some camaraderie. Mm-hmm. And so we structured three days to do just that. And I think the the short answer to the question is it begins with values, um, personal values um, that then, you know, sort of um, come together in a group fashion or in a team fashion. And the 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 hardest part is making that connection between what you value as an individual um, and what the team values. So, and if you don't make that connection, um, let's say that Cole, you value, I don't know, uh, we'll use one of uh, Jen's words, balance. And you happen to find yourself in a team or an organization um, or a job where you just can't find that balance. It's you're working 80 hour weeks and while you're making lots of money, 
um, and your career is advancing, you're not sleeping all that well at night because something internally um, has you off balance. Um, mm -hmm. Sooner or later, you will deselect. De and before you deselect, and what I mean is you'll leave, um, before that happens, your productivity, your performance, your the way you think about your the, the, the uh, discretionary time that you have on that job to do your best work will begin to recede. And sooner or later, it'll get to the point where you'll notice it at first, then the closest to you will notice it second, and then the larger team will notice it to the point where it's like your manager, your team leader would say, "What what's up with Cole? Um, and then sooner or later, you're just going to get to the point where your values clash so much with what clearly the team values that you just can't go on. Mm -hmm. So the best way that I know, and to answer your question, the best way that I know to, um, to build that kind of camaraderie is to ensure that at the, indiv the, at the individual level, you're clear about what you truly value. And in that book, um, in, the, in the last chapter, there is a very practical exercise. It's called the value sorter. Spend some time with that and you know, take the 36 values there that are kind of the universal values and figure out what, you know, what you're all about values-wise. And if you even struggle with that exercise, take a look at your spending habits, um, your bank account, your credit cards, what you spend your money on, and then what you spend your time on. It will become very clear to you very quickly what you truly value, um, especially the time element. Um, but go through that value sorter and then do it as a team and make that connection. So that's the, the that's a kind of a really practical way of doing it. And back to that that meeting, that three day meeting last week, that's a good bit of what we did um, and sharing stories that um, exhibit uh, the values that we hold uh, closest. So okay. there you go. Sweet, thank you. So you you would say almost that. It's kind of like a do or die in a way. Like if you're onboarding onto a team and your values don't align, then eventually it's going to go downhill no matter what. And there's no like, uh, I don't know, like revising of the cooperation. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I mean, you know, the, 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 the life is, is full of, of compromises. But I guess what I'm saying, I guess the message is that so much about business and your role within biz business is about fit. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so whether that's product market and one of one of the other questions in here, um, Aiden, and not to to steal your thunder, but I think what's the biggest mistake a startup can make early on? There's this notion of product market fit. Um, there is a notion of uh, people culture fit. And I and that's kind of why I wrote the book the way that I did, um, where the back end, the book, you know, the bookend, um, if you will, um, at the end of the book, really is about that people culture fit. And if you can't find that fit, um, keep looking for it. You'll know. You, you, I, I think probably, um, and you will sometime experience in your career um, a culture, a team, a boss, an organization where it just feels toxic. And and it's just really at that point it probably is do or die, and um, I don't want you to die. Yeah, definitely not. So Scott, we have a couple of people, um, Matt and Kevin. Um, a couple of people are in the waiting room. If you can let them in, that would be amazing. Aiden, um, do you want to ask a different question? Because I had that um, question about the startups, but I'm sure you have another question. And please introduce I can, yourself. I can you want me to ask it now? That'd be amazing. But introduce right, yeah. yourself, where you're from, all that jazz. How's it going? Um, I'm Aiden McKinster. Uh, I'm from Waterloo, New York, about 45 minutes east of Rochester on the three-way. Um, I'm in the School of Industrialized Studies, study, studying engineering applied to entrepreneurship. Um, my new question, new question. Um, um, is I was wondering, so you talk about like lean processes. Um, in your book and that's something that i was doing a little bit more more on like the uh, practical side doing kind of five best work over the summer but it's something i worked in but uh how do you personally when you're trying to create a lean process how do you make sure you don't over lean it to a point where it causes failure later on down the line if that makes sense uh well like the way that sorry did i cut you off 
Yeah, uh, um, just because like I feel like there's that point where it, it be it becomes kind of it creates more problems than it ends up solving in the end. If that makes sense when leading a process. Oh, the the practical answer to the question is that, um, and this is this is uh, where I depart from traditional lean manufacturing, lean production, lean as people have learned it in the book. Uh, or, or in um, you know in previous books about lean or in school um, is to do everything in a cross-functional way. Um, traditional lean continuous improvement has you working in a natural team that um, and you you can you know simplify your processes you know you know take the complexity and the complications out. But what it doesn't do is. Um, inform you where the 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 gaps in process a meet process b and what you're talking about can actually happen quite frequently if you are not working cross-functionally so in knowledge work which is where all of my work is so i work in uh, i work with technology companies 100 percent of them in the last couple of years that i've been working at insight they're all software they're all b2b software um, and so the, the, the unique aspect is that, um, while we're not working with a physical product, I always work with cross-functional teams. And so even if it's a sales team, I, we want to, we want to take 50% out of our sales cycle. We want to go from 180 days to 90 days, what have you. I will still have in the room, all the people that are involved in making a sale. And that goes from product people to engineering people to, en you know, solutions engineers to marketers to lead generators to pre-sales people to sales people to post sales people in b2b software there's a thing um, called customer success um, which is you know when renewals and expansions of sales happen um, and onboarding and implementation those folks come into play i involve them in the lean process optimization effort um, so that um, all of those various uh, and assorted downstream or upstream touch points and potential uh, breakage points are known in advance. And the second thing is that when you do this, it's always an experiment. It's never let's flip the light switch and turn some new process on company-wide. Never, ever, ever, ever. It's always a very small nested experiment um, that then gets iterated upon and potentially piloted as a broader uh, solution or standard. And you constantly learn from those accelerating, escalating implementations. So there's always the, the after action review, the validated learning part of it, so that you avoid uh, potential breakpoints. Awesome. Thank you. I, I think that Kind of really summarized it well. Yeah, I think that kind of aligns with some of the stuff that I was doing over the summer and kind of some of the stuff that we were running into over the summer that personally was kind of frustrating me because it was like, we do something and sure it would work for this one department, but it was also causing more problems for another at the same time. Thank you. Hi, I'm Red. I'm from Merrick on Long Island, and I'm studying small business management and product design and development with a focus in serving the queer community. Uh, Matt, when you wrote What the Unicorn Knows, you discussed a lot of examples from various companies. All of that was really interesting. What was your favorite company to discuss in terms of overall organizational value and success? Uh, in that, in What a Unicorn Knows or in general? I think in general, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, these days, I, I, I don't have the luxury of having a, a favorite because the portfolio of companies... Uh, that I work with, and just so that everyone knows, so um, Insight Partners, as 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 Jen said, is a, a VC PE private equity company, um, and it's unique in the fact that there's an investment side of the business which I know nothing about, um, and then there's an advisory side to the business, um, and it's the only private equity company that has a, a completely cross-functional advisory group of over 100 former operators. So we've all had experience out in the field in companies, and we bring that to to the four uh, to help the companies that have been invested in grow, scale, and have an exit, uh, meaning they you know, have an IPO, introductory public offering, or they get acquired by another company. Um, there, we have over 500 portfolio companies. So right now, I don't have the luxury of having a, uh, a, a favorite. Uh, my favorite tends to be whoever I'm working with right now and who's most engaged um, and who's having most success. But as a general category, 
I think the best way for me to, to, to answer that is, is not a specific company, but a category. Uh, I think it has to be healthcare and health tech. Um, for some reason, um, those that enter kind of the healthcare, medical, med tech, healthcare, however you want to think about it, um, they all sort of come from um, the healthcare world and are now applying that in, in, a, in a technology delivery system somehow. Just the notion of helping people, um, it, it, there's a, they're not completely money-minded. There's a humanitarian side to the work and there's just this far more palpable feel of whether we're talking about strategy, whether we're talking about a process, where we're talking, if we're talking about the customer experience or the patient experience or company I'm working with right now is all about clinical trials. Um, they talk about people more than stuff and more about, you know, about people than if you, if you map out any process and look at a process, you kind of stand back for that and, and say, well, gosh, what's missing? Well, in the white space are actually people doing the steps that you've mapped out. And I think in healthcare, they just pay a lot more attention to that. And it's just more fulfilling. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Sure. Hello. Um, my name is Leo. I'm from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, and my question is, in your experience, what um, do you think there are any key strategies and mindsets that um, people or businesses can um, adopt to foster a culture of continuous innovation, despite of the industries that are traditionally resistant to change? Good question. Um, first of all, I have been to Sao Paulo. I always like to make a connection between who I'm mm -hmm. talking to or with. Um, I've, I've been there once. It's been many, many years. It's been 15 years. Um, I got to find speak it? there in 2007 um, after my first book came out. So beautiful place, beautiful people. Um, it's a whirlwind visit. But anyway, um, okay. I guess the best way to answer this question would be to give you an example from my career. I spent a good bit of time working with the Los Angeles Police Department. When I was at Toyota and the University of Toyota, one of the things that we wanted to do to decrease our costs to the overall organization because it was run as a cost center was to develop sort of an externally focused learning program. Um, and one of the first uh, organizations to come to Toyota to get better was the Los Angeles Police Department. And at the time, they were under a consent decree by the Justice Department. You don't need to know all a lot about the history of LAPD, but they had some bad leadership. Um, there was a, an incident in the 1990s, um, you know, and, there was, and scandals that had gone on. And you talk about companies that are traditionally resistant to change. Any organization that is military in nature, command and control, even paramilitary like the LAPD is resistant to change. Um, and the reason for that is that very clear chain of command that is sacrosanct to how that how an organization runs. While it's very effective, very efficient, um, it is ten, you know, tends to be slower to change. So um, the interesting thing was that we were able to affect change in LAPD and the way that we did it was to focus on number one, things that were most important to uh, the leaders, things that they believed had to change. But at the same time, select projects that were at a level where it wouldn't be turn the world upside down change, it would be incremental change. And that change would be affected by people doing the work. Um, and this gets back to the notion of lean process and continuous improvement in general. And we would take a clamshell approach. I call it a clamshell approach. So air cover from leadership and then a ground, uh, you know, ground troop effort. And we didn't begin with um, actual police officers. We began with where we, where we thought would be the least disruptive uh, to the overall operation of the Los Angeles Police Department. And that happened to be those working the jails. These were non-sworn, in other words, civilian workers working for the Los Angeles Police Department. They didn't carry a gun. They didn't go through, you know, police training, everything like that. They were basically running, you know, two or three large jails in downtown Los Angeles. And that's where we began. So long story short, um, pick projects where they aren't huge. Um, they're not, um, you know, boil the ocean kind of, I'm sure you've heard that term before, boil the ocean kind of projects, but where little changes at fairly high leverage points um, will make a big difference 
And you start with one or two teams and you work with that team to improve a process with measurable results. And then you organically spread a little bit of light, a little bit of water on the teams that are most adjacent to those um, because that's where you'll see the most downstream effect to one of the earlier questions. And you begin to organically grow. And you know, in, in a few months, you have an organization that is uh, continuously improving without there being some big, huge uh, program that says, let's become continuous improvers. So that's my answer to that. To that. That's a great question. Fantastic. Uh, if I could just have a quick follow-up. Um, I am uh, My study area is global business and technology, somewhere between international business and IT. And uh, do you believe that this approach would work internationally, or do you think that different cultures are going to have different uh, reactions? Uh, well, I'm, uh, if, if I'm any proof, I have uh, worked in several different cultures where English was not the first language. Um, the actual culture of the folks I just talked about, those working the jail, um, were not how do I say this politically correctly? Um, they, they were they were multicultural in nature, um, not typical um, kind of where, where you when you think about uh, you know the American beat cop, um, so to speak, that you see on TV. Um, just very culturally diverse. Um, some of them did not even speak um, English that well. Um, so and I've and I've done this all over the world. Um, and. The nice thing is that there is a, a human tendency to at once be sort of lazy. Um, and if you couch it the right way, that laziness can become improvement if it's stuff that you care about that's getting in the way of stuff that you're really interested in. And you give them a method to consistently improve something by taking one of their own ideas and taking it to commercialization, so to speak. In other words, where it sees the light of day in an organization. It doesn't need, you don't need to make money from it, um, but um, a little bit of recognition that way. Um, and multiculturally, um, and here's improvement is, while it was born in the US, um, really took root in Japan. So by nature, it is um, multicultural. I would love to give some acknowledgement to your co-author, and I'm interested to how you met and how the project came together. Absolutely, uh, Pablo Dominguez is my um, is my co-author. He and I have been working probably since 2011, so well over a decade. I met him while he was working at a large organization called ADP. Um, I had been brought in by somebody else to do a one and a half day workshop with them. Um, I did not even know that he was the boss because the per person who brought me in, um, I thought was the boss. Um, he was very, very quiet, um, but he was kind of the quiet leader in the room. I didn't know until after the day and a half workshop that he was uh, he was in charge of things. So that was kind of a surprise. But he brought me in for a couple of other engagements. He left ADP. Uh, he went to a startup, a late stage startup called AppNexus, which was an advertising tech company that competed with uh, Google AdWords. It got bought. Uh, while he was there, I did work with him. He's kind of the innovator um, behind taking lean uh, thinking and applying it to the go-to-market world, uh, traditionally not an area, uh, and specifically sales and sales operations. Um, so he's a bit of an innovator that way, and we made great headway. And then when he left, uh, when that company got bought, he was looking for something to do. He ended up at Insight Partners. He uh, has basically grown that organization from a two-person uh, advisory group to over a hundred. Um, and I'll be honest, we're kind of like Bernie Toppin and Elton John. Now, I, I, I hopefully, you know, young folks, you know who those people are. Bernie writes the the words and Elton writes the, the music. Um, I am the worst marketer on the planet. Um, I'm the worst salesperson on the planet. And so I needed an Elton John to my Bernie Toppin. So I pitched the notion of this book, got a contract. I asked uh, Pablo if he would be interested in being my co-partner with the proviso that um, he would handle the marketing end of things and keep me honest um, in terms of the companies that, that we covered. Did not want it to be an Insight Partners book. So this is not anything sanctioned by our organization and he would be okay with that. Um, he thought about it uh, long and hard. Um, first, he said no, and then he said yes, and that's the um, um, that's that's basically our, our our partnership. So, words and music. 
You've been listening to Matthew May, and my hope is that what you hear are a series of considerations. I think one of the most respectful ways in which Matthew May leads is is by giving suggested frameworks. And I, I do see a lot of people want to p- plug and play. And I think being an, on the authentic quest of what is elegant, what works, what creates harmony, what creates congruence. These are all things that all six of Matthew May's books share. And I have really enjoyed having the School of Individualized Studies students be part of this program. I want to thank Scott Fitzgerald at Rock Fox Studio, our producer, and also our sponsor, executive coaching and strategy company, Agility 3R. 